Good evening. So tonight's talk is going to be about high blood pressure. So I've gone ahead and written up some numbers for you just for a beginning reference. So can you guess which number is normal? Normally the blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. And then sometimes the blood pressure makes it into the pre-high blood pressure stage, which is 121 over 130 to 139 over 81 to 89. And next, this is where we actually get into the medical definition of high blood pressure, which is a blood pressure of 140 to 159 over 90 to 99. And then finally, this is really high blood pressure. In other words, stage one blood pressure and stage two high blood pressure. In other words, over 160 over 100. So as people go through the um, risk levels of the high blood pressure, high Gravinder, uh, the risk for the complications of blood pressure definitely goes up the higher the numbers are. That's why uh, our blood pressure and as clinicians in the office usually goes up too when we have patients uh, coming in over 160. Um, it used to be that the idea was, oh no, their blood pressure is high, let's give them medication immediately to drop it a lot. And it was seen that sometimes that wasn't necessarily the best thing to do um, because if someone has gradually gotten their blood pressure up to uh, high levels, then their brain, their heart, and their kidneys in particular are used to receiving pressurized blood. And then if you drop it really suddenly, the, the, the stiffness of the arteries um, may not recover quite as fast as the blood pressure is dropping. And so the brain and the heart might feel it as, oh my gosh, I just lost a bunch of blood or I just lost a bunch of pressure. And so generally speaking, when we get into the higher levels, although don't get me wrong, there are cases where you need to be, someone needs to be in the emergency room and getting IV blood pressure lowering medications under close watch and so forth and so forth. But oftentimes in the clinical practice, you wanna kind of gradually bring the blood pressure down um, because if there's a big drop, then sometimes the um, body sees that and um, and doesn't get enough blood to the important parts of the brain and the heart and the kidneys in particular. Uh, so those are some of the areas of the body that are very sensitized to the blood pressure. So I'll just leave this up for reference on the side for a moment and dive into a little bit about just the basics of high blood pressure. Why do we care so much about your blood pressure? Um, well, it is a huge risk factor for most many diseases. In fact, they call blood pressure the silent killer because the higher the blood pressure is, well, the more likely people are to develop uh, aneurysms in the brain. In other words, the, um, I'll drop this for a second so I can illustrate. So the vessels in the body um, are, are kind of like pipes. They're used to seeing a certain amount of pressure um, placed by the blood in all directions. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why we can measure the blood pressure, usually up here in the arm, is because when the heart beats, it sends out a shock wave of force throughout the entire blood vessel system. So during that beat, that's when we get our top number. And as that heart relaxes and tries to fill with blood, um, and during that relaxation phase, there's a different pressure on the blood vessels. So that's why we have our top number and our bottom number. It really has to do with the strength of the uh, heartbeat, which is, um, and the, the way in which the, the, the blood vessels are responding to that. If the blood vessels are really, really stiff and really tight, then the blood pressure tends to be higher and uh, less forgiving when the pressures change suddenly. If the vessels are very plastic and fluid and can kind of mush and move and, and all that kind of stuff, and very responsive, uh, then they tend to um, have lower blood pressures in general. Um, so the high pressure uh, on the blood vessels, these blood vessels are kind of designed, if you want to use that word, uh, to be best at these lower um, blood pressures. They, they tend to function best at these kinds of numbers. Um, 
the prehypertension or the um, or the normal blood blood pressures. And if you're putting a lot of pressure on it for a long time, then that pipe can develop like a little blurb. Um, and that little pouching out, well, that's not a good thing. It's called an aneurysm. And if that happens in the brain, the little pouched out um, section uh, it can be very delicate and is sometimes prone to spontaneous rupture, bleed in the brain equals a stroke equals usually not very good outcomes. Um, and can be a cause of sudden death, which is one of the reasons why we call high blood pressure the silent killer. And so to get another sense of what that aneurysm might look like, you might get a um, one of those little long balloons and to kind of squeeze it and you can see the little blurb kind of um, popping up between the fingers and that will give kind of an illustration of what one looks like. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't that fancy with my props tonight so I don't have that illustration so I have to use your imagination uh, with that. Uh, also, high blood pressure um, puts you at higher risk for heart attacks as well. So similarly, that high pressure uh, damages the inner lining of the cells known as the endothelium and it makes it more likely to collect plaques and to also have um, problems in the heart as well. And as also mentioned, the kidneys located back in the back, um, they are also very sensitive to the effects of high blood pressure over time. And so if you are happening to be in medical school and just happen to be doing an autopsy, you can often tell the patients that had um, high blood pressure because their kidneys are shrunken compared to the normal size kidneys. And a shrunken kidney just don't work quite as good as a regular size kidney, generally speaking. So those are usually chronic kidney failure um, kinds of patients. <clears throat> so basically, uh, we talked about stroke, we talked about heart disease. There's other uh, things that the high blood pressure puts people a little bit at risk for. But those are kind of the big ones. Um, heart failure, heart attack, uh, strokes, and kidney failures are really the main um, complications. Uh, there is one other complication with the heart with the folks with high blood pressure, and this is the reason why on our uh, checklists there's a little checkbox to see, hey, has your patient with high blood pressure had a baseline EKG? Well, why on earth would we want a baseline EKG in somebody whose blood pressure has been up a little bit? Well, because when people come into the office, uh, their blood pressure may be a little high, a little low, um, depending on what's going on. Sometimes there's a little stress, so maybe pain. Maybe they just had a bunch of um, um, Motrin and other cough syrups and Sudafed because they've got a cold, and those might have brought the blood pressure up temporarily. So we like to double check after a few days or so to make sure that is that really a a high blood pressure is that just kind of fluke. And the trouble is is that sometimes these flukes um, might be actually happening all the time. Let's say that somebody has a stress-filled life and they happen to have blood pressure that is responsive to stress, then they go around and uh, you know these cars are getting in my way and man I had to wait in line over here and all sorts of other situations that come up during the day that might um, cause that high blood pressure to go up. Well, I may or may not capture that during an office visit, but um, whenever these kinds of things are going on, the body is capturing it because those blood vessels, whatever your blood pressure is, that's ups and downs and highs and lows throughout the day, um, they're receiving the uh, brunt of it, so to say. So. Um, sometimes as these blood vessels are kind of getting impacted, other structures in the body might also get impacted as well. And an EKG is a simple screen to see if there's been enough of these high blood pressures, you know, throughout the course of a day or throughout the course of decades of uh, measurements to actually remodel the heart, and that is not a good thing. You want your heart in its original model, you don't want it remodeled. <laughs> um, basically, when the heart gets uh, remodeled, uh, usually the big chamber um, gets enlarged. So the idea is that when you've got your um, 
um, left ventricle. So that's the big chamber that's pumping the blood out to the whole body. And if it's working against a lot of resistance, if you're constantly uh, having high blood pressure, that's resistance force for it to pump against, well, like every other model, muscle in the body, it gets big. So I do a bunch of uh, weightlifting and I get big biceps. Well, same thing with the heart. You push against a lot of pressure for a long time and it enlarges. The only trouble is it's not nice musculoskeletal muscles. It's an inside muscle that's really not supposed to change shape that much. And when it changes shape, uh, we can see it on an EKG sometimes. So we call it left ventricle hypertrophy, basically the left side of the heart, that chamber that does the workhorse load, um, hypertrophies or gets bigger than it's supposed to be. And those folks are at higher risk for things like um, a heart failure, like that, that muscle is supposed to have a certain amount of thickness and a certain size in order to be most effective for your whole life. Another thing that can sometimes happen is the little tiny chamber that's just above that high blood, uh, that big ventricle is called the left atrium. So its whole purpose in life is to collect that fresh oxygenated blood from the lungs and deliver it to the big workhorse to send out to the rest of the body. Um, and so sometimes if the other chambers of the heart, like the right atrium that collects the blood from the rest of the body, um, pumps it out to the ventricle and to the lungs and um, back on and so forth, so depending on how long the blood pressure has been high for, some of these other chambers can also get enlarged and we can see that in EKG. And so when the uh, atria get enlarged, that puts people at higher risk for um, atrial fibrillation, which is where the, instead of doing this lump, bump, bump, bump kind of dance that the heart does, the lub dub song, uh, where the atrium and then the, the ventricles uh, work together to efficiently pump the blood through the body, well, if the atria kind of go, oh, 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 what's going on here, and start um, dancing and shaking and fibrillating, as it were, then it can make the bottom part go very, very fast, and that's not good for you either. So um, that can put people at high risk for a stroke. And so those are some of the mechanisms by which uh, having that high blood pressure for a long time can do some restructuring damage to the body, and which is why it's very, very important that people go know what their numbers are, get screened, make sure that a home blood pressure cuff is available if you happen to be, you know, keeping track of your blood pressures. These things are not that expensive these days. I think like five, 10 bucks, or maybe 20 at the, at the CVSs and pharmacies of the world. I mean, they're, they're not too expensive these days. So, when getting a blood pressure cuff, it's important to uh, double check it against the one in the clinic. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've had people bring in numbers from home and our numbers are totally different. And part of the reason that they're totally different is uh, because something silly like the blood pressure cuff doesn't fit quite right or the um, batteries are dying on the blood pressure cuff because you've been using it for a few years and just now dragged it out of the closet. So it's vitally important if you're using your home kit to monitor your blood pressure that you just make sure that it's a good, reliable, accurate number. And if it isn't, at least you know how many points off it tends to be. <laughs> um, so that's one of the reasons why I like to have people come in for like a three-day blood pressure check and bring your home kit and basically compare our numbers and your numbers and do it both at the same time so that it's accurate together. So. And that way, um, you can also get a sense for how your treatment is going. Because when you're at the normal range, people usually don't have any symptoms. People often don't have any symptoms here. And guess what? Very often they don't have any symptoms here either. <laughs> and even believe it or not, in the uh, stage two high blood pressure stage, by the way, of course, for those who are just joining us, these two are your high blood pressure ranges. Um, sometimes people don't have any symptoms over here too. and. So that's why getting a monitor or going to your local pharmacy or some other trusted reputed place to get screened um, at least once a year, maybe twice a year, depending if you're at high risk or if you've got diabetes, these numbers tend to go up a lot more and the need for blood pressure control um, goes up. 
um, as well, depending on what's going on with the body. Uh, sometimes if somebody has an issue with a um, big blood vessel wall that's already been damaged, let's say that somebody had been a smoker, which of course is going to be a big no-no in all of our videos, so please, if you're using any form of tobacco, use this as yet another reminder. Best thing to do for your health is to get away from this stuff, right? Okay. Um, good work. <laughs> Check it out. Um, hi, Tom. And so, um, so when somebody is used as tobacco and happens to be a gentleman and happens to be in 60s, especially over age 65, the risk of a um, abdominal aneurysm is huge, which is why we recommend screening for that at those ages. But anyway, if someone happens to have a uh, kind of a swollen, tore up blood vessel, um, we usually recommend that these pressures be kept much lower than even the average um, blood pressure goals that we often set for our patients. So. So these kind of goals, these are just very general goals, um, but of course, uh, speak about the details with your own private physician as well. So um, risk factors. So uh, according to my latest uh, up-to-date uh, patient education article, it is extremely common. We knew this. Uh, blood pressure, that's one of the reasons why it's one of my um, talks tonight is because this topic comes up a lot in clinic. And as people get older, the rates for high blood pressure are getting even higher. So right now across the whole United States, um, I guess it's got it broken back down by demographics. Among the African-American population in our country, 32% has high blood pressure. And amongst the Caucasian population, I guess uh, 23% and also the, um, some of the Hispanic population was about 23%. But then after people get older, so, um, amongst people over age 60, um, getting back to those uh, demographics, and my friend's like waving at me here. <laughs> um, um, as people get over age 60, the high blood pressure is in 65% of um, African American folk. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I miss, misspoke. 65% uh, of African American men and 80% of African American women and of the uh, Caucasian folk, 55% uh, of the white men and 65% of white women. So basically, everybody seems to be getting a lot of high blood pressure as they get older. Why? Well, as you might know from watching my videos, there is a lot of reasons. And the food, the food, the food is a huge reason. Um, one of my favorite doctors in the world, Dr. Greger, who has this awesome book called How Not to Die, which has a whole chapter on high blood pressure and heart disease and cancers. I mean, he's got all sorts of good stuff in there. I love him. Um, great work that he's doing. And he's got a cookbook coming out this fall, apparently, so keep an eye out for that as well. But uh, for the purpose of his book, they found a study that looked at some folks in middle of nowhere Amazon. So this is the place, one of those places um, where people really had not gotten contaminated by our modern society civilization, civilization very much. And the one thing that they did not have was a salt shaker. And they went their entire lives without a single lick of salt other than what was naturally in the ground that was coming up through the plants or animals or whatever it was that they were eating out there. And the blood pressure of the folks in their 60s, 70s, 80s was identical to the blood pressure of the teenagers. And uh, just as a, another prop, ta-da, how not to die, very good book. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> and, so, um, and so it just shows one more time that as people are getting older, Yes, you're getting older, but you're getting exposed to a lifetime full of foods that contain salt. And I so often have people that come up and say, but doctor, I do not add salt to my diet. Well, they might not realize you're adding salt to your diet, but there are many hidden sources of salt. For example, if I remember some of the top leading hidden sources, one was chicken because everybody thinks chicken is healthy. Um, not necessarily, but the chicken industry generally often uses um, salt to be injected into the chickens, kind of plumps them up, and it causes water to retain in them because a heavier bird sells more because, you know, it's heavier, so you get more weight, and 
Um, also has to think something to do with the preservation technique. So basically, people are getting salt in things like their restaurant foods are usually pretty salty. <laughs> um, uh, if they're happening to still eat meat, uh, that is a big source of salt. Cheese is a huge source of salt. You would not think about it, but um, not only is it a source of um, saturated fat, all sorts of stuff that's really not good for you, and a uh, perfect segue, I was about to say it for an even um, bread has uh, sodium as well. Yes, a lot of the breads are laced with sodium. Um, I have occasion to walk across the street from my clinic where there's a grocery store once in a while, and I picked up a whole wheat bread thingy, and I thought, oh, I haven't had bread like this in a while, I'll take it back, and I could not believe how salty the thing was. See, the trick is, is that when you have an actual low salt diet, <laughs> um, and don't get me wrong, we need a little bit, but our bodies are incredibly well able to cling to salt when we need it. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, for the most part, unless you got some other stuff, but that's all another conversation. So I had this um, little piece of bread, and I swear to God, the salt reached out and slapped me across the face and said, here I am at salt. Because your taste buds change. After only about three weeks of a reduced salt diet, everything will taste normal again, and you actually be able to taste some of the finer flavors in your food, especially if you're having actual, real, whole food. Um, is Ezekiel bread better? Uh, can you grab an Ezekiel and we'll look at the salt ratings on there? It's good to have an assistant and we'll take a look at that for you, Gizvinder. I believe that the salt in Ezekiel is not too bad, actually. Um, and then, uh, speaking of props, I got a few things I collected off scene. Uh, if you have the um, culinary graces to make your own, uh, you can actually make your own whole grain breads and add as much or as little salt as you like. This was brought to us from a friend who uh, visits with here uh, once in a while. Um, and so I don't think he added any salt to it, at least it didn't taste much. Um, uh, no, the Ezekiel is, is indeed coming. Um, other hidden sources of salt, so things like sauces, pizzas, um, basically American junk food, you know, usually has salt in it. Uh, again, went to the um, airport. There was a little um, place where you could get little tiny bags of popcorn. I said, oh, it looks pretty benign. It's just popcorn, right? And again, it was just loaded with salt. Um, so um, popcorn in general is actually pretty healthy for you. I've got it as an example of um, I don't know, just uh, random uh, popcorn that I found at the grocery store the other day. So not an endorsement by any means of any of these demonstrations. Um, but basically, whole grains can be very helpful for finding blood pressure. And yes, it includes popcorn if you don't throw a pile of salt on it. Um, and if you don't care for yellow popcorn, they have uh, blue popcorn that's out there. And by the way, a spoiler alert, when you pop blue popcorn, it's still white. Maybe a t tiny bit blue, but it's really still white. So anyway, don't get your hopes up just because it looks blue on the outside. Uh, maybe it's got some hidden benefits or something, I don't know. But uh, other examples of whole grains. Uh, so several servings of whole grains a day. So just a random bag of rice. Uh, this happens to be a whole grain um, black rice. Uh, generally speaking, the darker and the more colorful, whatever it is that you're choosing, the more antioxidants, the more health benefits. Um, I was going to try to find some purple potatoes. We just happen to be out of them today. Uh, more whole grains. So this is another whole grain. This is a crisp bread. And looking at the salt, it's got 50 milligrams um, of salt in it. This is a whole grain rye flour, uh, yeast, and salt is the only ingredients in there. So it's a little kind of a crisp bread. Um, another one as a whole grain, which is good for fighting um, blood pressure, oats. Oats are good for like everything. And so Ingredients, oats, that's like it, no, nothing. And of course, the uh, suggestion from the manufacturer is to put like a boatload of salt in there, which obviously I'm not recommending that you do. Aha, uh -huh, so we have um, some sprouted, uh, um, thanks, we found a package here. Um, so this is an Ezekiel, let us see what is the, so you get instant satisfaction when you, um, do this. Oh yes, farin uh, butter does contain salt for sure, and it's really bad for you too, so don't do it. Stay away from the butter. Uh, 
Where is the salt in here? This thing has wheat, water, raisins, barley, uh, malted barley, uh, sprouted rice, sprouted organic barley, more oats, organic sprouted uh, mullet and corn and brown rice and yeast, wheat, gluten, uh, sea salt is in there as is cinnamon. Um, and it's like at the very end. And this one is uh, 60 milligrams um, in one slice. So yeah, it does contain a little bit, but if you're aiming at like less than a thousand uh, milligrams a day or less than 500 or whatever your personal goal is, um, in some conditions people actually set uh, very specific amounts of salt. For example, if you've had that high blood pressure for a long time, and your um, heart's remodeled and you've got heart failure and your feet are all swelled up with um, fluid because of all this stuff. Well, basically uh, that fluid um, follows the salt. So sometimes in the summertime people notice their hands and feet kind of swell up a little bit more than other times. Um, sometimes if they're lower the amount of salt that can also help fight that kind of thing. And so for the folks with the um, with the heart failure, it can be critical to um, manage the amount of salt that goes in because that heart is so sick and it's working so hard that having less salt can make a big difference in um, an improvement uh, with that. So anyway, very important. Um, so even our standard up-to-date uh, generic uh, patient education guideline, which I'm going to um, check out is Lifestyle changes. So, number one, reduce the amount of salt. And I think we covered that <laughs> at Lib here. Um, number two, lose weight if you happen to be overweight or obese. And if you don't know if you're overweight or obese, it's a good thing to check out. There's something called a body mass index. And if you're curious on how to lose weight, if you're having trouble, um, Staying away from the better is uh, one way of doing it. Uh, a whole food plant-based diet with no added oils and so forth can, is an extraordinarily effective way. In fact, um, in my experience, it's like the most effective way to lose weight quickly and safely and like fixing everything all at the same time. And the number one place that I recommend to go check that out is um, Dr. Barnard's websites, either the PCRM.org, that's short for Physicians Committee for Responsive Medicine, or his nutritionmd.org, uh, which has a 21 day kickstart thing and it's got tons of recipes and stuff. Um, so anyway, so avoiding salt, losing weight, um, watching out for that alcohol. So the folks that are hitting the bottles and the beer cans and stuff, that also has an effect on the blood pressure as well as being carcinogenic. So, um, which speaking of carcinogenic stuff, tobacco of course is next on the list. And then exercise. Um, believe it or not, when people sit around all day, our blood vessels, our bodies are not exactly designed to be sitting and staring at computer screens or TV screens or basically workstations. And so pretty much our entire modern life is like not how our bodies are designed. Otherwise, then I would be like little buttery thing sitting in a chair. Anyway, but anyway, uh, so staying uh, a little bit active and so um, trying to aim for 30 minutes and some people are like, oh my gosh, don't tell people how much to exercise because then they'll um, feel sad that they can't make 30 minutes every day. Well, I feel you tell people what the guidelines say and then encourage people to do whatever it is that they can do. So if you're only doing zero a day and you work your way up to 10 minutes of doing something, anything with the body, that is way better than nothing. Is it as good as 30 minutes on the health of the blood vessels? Yeah, probably not. but don't beat yourself up if you're not quite there yet. Just get a plan together so you can um, figure it out. And by the way, exercising with friends is huge because um, you motivate each other and it's also uh, more fun too because you have people to do it with as well. It gets kind of that social aspect going. Um, sometimes the stress reduction can be a very helpful thing too. So other basics like getting enough sleep, um, learning things like a little bit of meditation or breathing exercises uh, that can settle down the autonomic nervous system. So basically um, different ways of being able to relax and kind of self-care, you know, the basics. Um, alrighty, so more on there. We talked about um, some of the things that that high blood pressure can cause, which is why you're um, uh, watching. Uh, so 
people don't always find out why there's a specific cause, like maybe five to seven percent of cases. Um, there actually sometimes is a case where there's a blood vessel that feeds the kidney. Um, the kidneys are very, very sensitive to the amount of blood pressure that we have. Um, part of it and, uh, is because if you take your kidney and if you like smush it out, I mean, it covers an obscene amount of area because it is like your body's filter. I think they said that at any given time about, don't quote me on this, but somewhere around like a quarter of the blood circulating the body at any one time is going through those kidneys. Um, and so it is a uh, um, huge um, area that the blood pressure um, uh, gets to. Thank you. And so basically, and it's also little itty bitty tiny tiny blood vessels. And so it's uh, got this whole built in mechanism to self regulate the blood pressure. So if there's um, problems with the arteries in the inside the kidney, uh, sometimes that can keep the blood pressure really high. And sometimes it takes a very special kind of an ultrasound to that area to figure that out. So anyway, just another reason why um, it's awesome to continue to improve the diet, but please always um, include your physician uh, in your conversations, especially because it's kind of hard to get like an EKG on your own. Um, alrighty, so yep, covered some of the medications a while ago that tend to trigger it. Um, I forgot to mention steroids. Uh, steroids can drive the blood pressure up. Um, Motrin, everybody's favorite medicine in my area. Um, non-sterile anti-inflammatory, so that's Motrin, naproxen, or Aleve, and so forth. Uh, some of the antihistamines, again, some of the medications people take when they get a cold, it pops the blood pressure up. Diet pills, yes, another uh, thing is when people are struggling to lose weight, sometimes they go to see their friendly endocrinologist or their friendly diet doctor downtown, and they give them speed, they give them like medicalized amphetamines, and and one of the risk factors for this is it drives the blood pressure up and puts people at high risk for um, all these complications. Uh, some of the antidepressant medications can also bring the blood pressure up and there's always other medications that can do it as a side effect. Uh, sometimes uh, oral contraceptives, so some of the birth control pills can do it. Thyroid conditions, so again, if somebody has a problem with their thyroid, um, it can cause the heart rate to go up, can cause the blood pressure to go up and so ruling that as an underlying cause. Um, and of course, the kidney disease as well. So, um, of course, age, we mentioned that the older the people get, the higher the blood pressure tend to be. Uh, family history, I always like to ask about how is your parents and grandpa and everybody else, because if there's a lot of folks in the family with high blood pressure, you got the genes sitting there, often um, those genes will express themselves at one point, especially if you follow the Standard American diet, which is usually a sure way of allowing these all to go through. And of course, being sedentary, and as uh, Farhan has pointed out, um, even a brisk walk in 30 minutes is exercise. Um, if you go to Dr. Gregory's nutritionfacts.org, you'll find there a link to his Daily Dozen app. Or if you just go to your app store and look up Daily Dozen, he actually has some of the best recommendations um, of what's recommended for the amount of exercise and it actually has like a specific walking speed to shoot for and again just a suggestion if you wanted to check it out don't go shooting for that speed in two seconds if you're not used to moving around um, alrighty so things to consider this one um, I'm referencing now is Dr. Barner's Nutrition MD article on the topic so there's a bunch of different kinds of dietary patterns that have been proposed to help reduce uh, blood pressure one of the most famous is the DASH diet, in which things that are potassium rich, like bananas, uh, which are sort of potassium rich, uh, and things like dates, which are really high in potassium, and other foods that are rich in potassium are suggested in order to help counteract the effects of all that salt, the sodium, that is going in. And by the way, those um, things are always wonderful, but at the same time, um, not generally enough because the DASH diet also involves other things that uh, don't necessarily help the blood pressure as well. Um, and so basically it was based on the fact that people noticed that um, plant-based diets um, basically bring the blood pressure down very quickly. 
A quick aside from that, and it, I found it to be very commonly true. Um, even my rheumatologist, uh, she mentioned that one of her friends, um, also a physician, like an internal medicine doc or something, um, she said, can you believe this? My friend, he's an internal medicine doctor, and he got high blood pressure, and he changed his diet. He started eating more plants, and believe it or not, his blood pressure went down. I'm sitting like, yep. I know, I know. <laughs> so this, this is my life, you know. Give people accurate information and just watch the magic happen. <laughs> um, Anywho, so why is it that the um, plant-based diet is so effective? Um, it changes, for one thing, the um, viscosity of the blood, the thickness of the blood um, is a little bit better when the um, um, blood pressure is down and when the amount of uh, meat in particular is down. Um, the vegetables and fruits are also rich in potassium, which brings the blood pressure down. Uh, so uh, many fruits and vegetables are indeed uh, excellent sources of potassium. Uh, yes, that's exactly the app I was talking about, Farhan. Uh, Dr. Gregory's Daily Dozen. Um, and then sodium intake, obviously, we talked about that already, and the alcohol. Um, so the Nurses' Health Study, which is a huge study that came out a number of years ago, found that, that the women that had the highest amount of actual folate, um, which is found in foliage or dark green leafy vegetables, which are some of the healthiest things on the planet, by the way, um, had much less risk factor for developing high blood pressure than the women that had a lot less of it. So um, the ones that were having the highest amount, um, which was about a thousand micrograms per day, um, had only a third of the risk of the folks at only like 200 micrograms or barely a spinach leaf on there. Uh, vitamin C um, didn't seem to pan out as far as it going, um, keeping the body weight in activity, so there's pretty much the same there. Um, and then last but not least, if you go over to my other favorite resource, nutritionfacts.org, uh, there's a nice little summary about other reasons why um, meat and, and sugar, and in particular like high fructose corn syrup, um, increases the blood pressure. Well, th one of the mechanisms is uh, uric acid levels. So that's something that our body tries to break down. Um, and so again, salt intake, industrially manufactured fructose, which is pretty much terrible for you and all, which, uh, ways um, those brought the blood pressure up and uh, he notes on the side that if you have um, 20 servings of fruit, in other words the same amount of fructose that you find in 20 servings of actual honest to god fruits and vegetables and stuff, uh, that did not affect the blood pressure but when they got it from um, even a, a, a smaller version of that from high fructose corn syrup, poop, which in our society is very commonly found in drinks, uh, especially the sodas kinds. Um, so one reason to make your own uh, ginger ale if you need it. <laughs> um, all right, um, and then a whole bunch of studies they mention um, amongst people that have a traditional plant-based diet. Um, again, just like the people in the jungle that does not have any uh, outside source whatsoever, the blood pressure of the young and the old was identical and the arteries were um, perfect. Even back in the, uh, gosh, I forget how many thousands of years ago, but it's like one of the earliest Chinese medicine um, uh, things. When they translated the ancient Chinese, it was basically saying that people who ate a lot of salt had hardening of their pulse. In other words, they were noticing that the people that ate the most salt were having high blood pressure. They just didn't have the same words for it. Um, but yeah, it's something that people have known for literally thousands of years that um, high blood pressure, essentially, and that salt is not so good for you. Um, Gravinder, I'll have to get back with you on the vitamin D. Uh, the vitamin D, uh, Dr. Greger has some great uh, resources on that and how it helps with uh, longevity if done on a regular basis. Uh, I think about 1,000, 2,000 units for most people is okay but I don't think that it specifically lowered the blood pressure. So um, so it might have to wait and see if there's a study that comes out on that. And uh, I'm sure when it does, I'm sure it will be on nutritionfacts.org <laughs> at some point. Uh, alrighty, so more show and tell. I've got a few more uh, foods that are specifically shown to help uh, lower the high blood pressure. Um, I forgot to bring it. I di a different website did show um, uh, <laughs> 
um, apples was helpful, the, the skin of the apple in particular. Uh, hi, Crystal, good to see you again. Uh, so other things that are helpful. This is one of my favorite foods out there for most general stuff, flax seeds. These little gems are incredibly healthy, good for a ton of stuff, good for the breast, good for the prostate, and good for blood pressure, and good for um, not having as much of a waste as you would like. Uh, the best part about these flax seeds, besides them being another whole grain, is they can be um, ground up right before use um, and add them to maybe your uh, whole grain oatmeal or something. Um, this is a really good combination, by the way, uh, during breakfast or any time that you feel like having a whole grain. Uh, there's some studies on, generally speaking, whole grains, and so I brought over some more whole grains. So it's just another example of, oops, sorry, upside down and backwards. It doesn't matter. Everything's upside down for you guys. Anyway, um, you can, of course, make your own bread whole grains and I showed you the other uh, versions of that earlier uh, and then there is more fun stuff that brings down the blood pressure like cocoa um, this is actually very healthy for you as well um, we tend to get the undutched version because it's uh, if it's dutched it's got some sort of processing done and your um, antioxidants are actually going to be um, a little bit less in that version and as you can see, this is ingredients is only one thing. Um, actually, you probably can't see it because it's backwards, but it's ingredients is cocoa. Uh, there's no sodium, no cholesterol, no nothing. It is just like ground up um, awesomeness. Uh, we haven't really gone over herbs. This is kind of the show and tell uh, part, so we're kind of getting, getting there. Um, but yeah, so obviously this can go in things like your oatmeal, and it goes very well with fruit and other natural uh, good sweeteners. Uh, and be, be wary of words like natural, by the way, because there are some very unnatural, quote unquote, natural things out there, like some of the agaves are like highly processed and stuff. So um, be, be aware of things like that. Um, there is some stuff to be said with uh, seaweed. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this is wakabi or not, um, but uh, wakami seaweed is a type that is um, sometimes eaten in, uh, Asia, the girls that have it swear by it for their um, uh, clear skin and uh, beauty of the skin as well, but um, some of the seaweeds are very good for keeping the blood pressure down. And then, lo and behold, beets and beet juice um, is very good for fighting the blood pressure as well. And this is another reason why I mention um, having uh, whole foods in general, um, because yeah, you can drink a lot of beet juice, um, but I had an experience when I was at my uh, last uh, job location where I was complaining because I didn't know where to find the Biota beet juice, which was the only one that I knew of that I could get easily and cheaply at a grocery store. <laughs> Maybe there's other varieties out there, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not that much of a shopper <laughs> to know what else is out there. Uh, but anyway, I was using this to help control my arthritis, uh, and I was complaining bitterly that I couldn't find it up, up in Mississippi. And my friend sent me a thing of beet juice uh, on Amazon. Who knew? You can go to these places and a day later, or two days later, I had beet juice uh, sitting in, my, in front of my door. And I am not a huge fan of beet juice. I mean, I tolerate it. It's, for me, it was like medicine, right? And so I gulp down the beet juice and I wait for it to affect my fingers and nothing happened. And I felt cheated, it was like I had to drink this yeah, yucky beet juice in order to get this effect for my fingers and I didn't even get the effect. And then when I read the, um, when I read the bottle, it was dried, powdered, reconstituted beet juice. So basically the active ingredient that's in the fresh beet juice is a little bit delicate and when you dry it and powder it and mush it and like blast it, uh, basically it killed the active ingredient and so that's why I had this um, uh, useless uh, beet juice. But the original or actually eating the um, beets themselves are very, very good. Um, so let's see what else is on my list. Um, greens, I didn't bring the greens out but basically anything that's dark green and leafy is going to be extremely good. And finally, hibiscus tea. Oops, I just dropped some, so 
You'll have to use your imagination, but there's a lot of flavors and varieties of hibiscus teas. Uh, one of the more famous uh, brands is the Celestial Seasonings. Um, they've got it in, the one that I just dropped is like the watermelon flavored, but this is like raspberry flavored. They've got lemon flavor. They've got a bazillion different kinds of flavors, even um, cherry flavored and mixed berry flavored. But it's very easy to get hibiscus tea. Um, the one that was studied for the blood pressure, I think, was using four uh, cups of hibiscus tea a day in that, or either that or it was like one cup, but it was like super steeped, it like had like four bags of tea in it or something like that. So anyway, so these, uh, so this is one easy way of bringing that blood pressure down um, for a lot of people. Um, and again, caveat, little stars, of course, with all these. If you have blood pressure problems, please go check with your physician so that you can make sure that other things like the heart and other blood vessels are doing okay. You want to make sure your kidneys are okay before you go off and doing anything. Um, all right, and for and which chocolates are healthy, I'm going to refer you back to Dr. Greger's um, presentations on chocolate. Uh, I will say that the best chocolate, the one that wins out over everything, is generally some version or another, um, you know, forget the brand name, it really doesn't matter, it's like 100% cacao, because if you have 100% cacao or if you get that fancy raw cacao nibs or something like that, um, then those are okay. Once people start adding all that sugar and once you get like the um, popular milk chocolates and things like that, the dairy and the sugar actually counter affect the healthy benefits of the um, cacao powder. So if you want the nectar of the gods, try to get as close to the original um, version as possible. and. I'm sure that people have come up with all sorts of um, recipes that are good for you. Um, one of my friends here created a healthy chocolate pudding, and I will tell you that is really good. It's basically that silken tofu. You add some of this, you add a little bit of maple syrup, and you just take a blender and go And after a few minutes, you get this really silken um, uh, stuff that is really tasty and actually tastes like chocolate pudding. So that's one example of a way in which you can have healthy chocolates. If you're going to go to the grocery store and uh, pick up chocolate, uh, even Dr. Ornish says that he has one square of high quality chocolate a day. Um, and just live in life, I mean, but the, if you're going to go to the grocery store and try to sit there and say, oh, my doctor told me I have to eat chocolate, and then you go buy a bag of, you know, junk, uh, don't be surprised when that junk actually comes back to bite you in your butt or just causes your butt to grow, um, which is the more common problem uh, that's involved with chocolate sometimes. Um, and uh, best time during the day to check my blood pressure? Actually, Gravinder, that's a good question because I get that all the time. Uh, some people take it right when they get up, um, and that's okay for uh, a baseline. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that, yeah, it's good to actually get it a couple of times during the day. So like, how's it in the morning? How's it in the afternoon? How's it in the evening? Not to go like crazy in one particular day and be like <sighs> checking your blood pressure all the time because then you're probably gonna have that anxiety induced blood pressure on top of everything else because you're so worried about, oh my God, what's my blood pressure? You don't, you wanna get out of that cycle too. Um, but if a couple days you check in the morning, a couple days you check in the afternoon, a couple days you check in the evening or vary it one time and the other, um, Obviously, the time to check the blood pressure is not when you've just been watching or reading or getting um, bad uh, news or something along those lines because um, those things are all going to make your blood pressure high. Uh, and also, it's good to sit down and uh, rest for a few minutes before checking your blood pressure. And ideally, you want to have your uh, arm at about the same level as your heart, so kind of raised a little bit if you happen to have... I think I've got this little prop music stand handy, you know, have the arm at about heart level or so. I mean, I'm just uh, improvising now because I didn't have it handy, but just about heart level, have the cuff on, be relaxed. Don't be sitting here jabbering um, because if you jabber, your blood pressure will go up um, just because you're being active and using all these muscles, you know, down there. Uh, so basically there's um, little techniques for taking your blood pressure. If you have a too small cuff, your blood pressure is going to be big If you're uh, or higher. If you have a cuff that's ginormous compared to the size of your arm, it's going to be artificial low, artificially low. 
Um, so again, these are reasons why when you're trying to figure out, well, how often should I check mine? Or obviously if you're changing your regimen, you're changing your diet, you're eating more chocolate, I guess, or, or more specifically cacao. Um, then those kinds of things, um, you can do some stuff on your own, but it's also good to bounce it off of your uh, family practice or other physician who you happen to be um, taking care of. As far as herbs, um, I don't actually have any specific herbal recommendations, only because I really don't have any data on it. If I did, I would have had it in my um, of my list. Uh, I guess the closest that I come to an herb uh, for blood pressure is actually the various versions of hibiscus that are out there, because what is hibiscus tea? It is literally a flower um, from the hibiscus plant, and and that is a fun home project because places like Ho Lowe's and Home Depot sell hibiscus plants. They do not tolerate the frost, so they will die off in the winter time if they get a chance for a frost. But they're wonderful um, plants we can bring indoors if you happen to live here in Florida as well. Um, but basically, the fun thing to do with hibiscus, um, you take that hibiscus flower right off the plant. Or one that's, those flowers are only good for a day, so you really you know, can enjoy it for the day and wait for it to wilt and then use it after that. But you take it off right off the plant and it's got that long beautiful stamen in the center you just pluck out the stamen because otherwise your tea is going to be filled with pollens and that's kind of gross so you just kind of wash it off and then uh, take that flower and throw it into some hot or some boiling water and that flower will get kind of slimy and goopy and it will blanch it will turn white and the color will be imparted into the water and so then you'll have a glass of like purpley red water which will be very dark and because I'm simple and I love simple things like this, you take that um, purpley water and you just add a few drops of lemon juice into it and you'll see the acid reacts with that um, flower juice and it'll turn the whole thing like light pink. And so it's a kind of fun thing I think to watch. I tend to like it natural as it is, but some people add like on a little honey or a little maple syrup or something in there. Um, you know, mix it with stevia um, or something like that. So, so that's my uh, <laughs> little home experiment if you want to play around with it. And uh, I'd recommend the um, red flowers in particular because they have the most pigment in there. But there's your uh, Jamaican tea recipe, as it, as it's also known as. Uh, other than that, as far as herbs goes, um, I just don't happen to have any resources with good numbers and good data um, yet. I'm sure more will come as things usually come. So. Anyway, uh, it's getting late. I do want to <laughs> go off and do some other stuff for now. Um, and yes, if you are in Mexico, you probably have a lot of those um, hibiscus tea, um, hibiscus flowers abundantly growing around. You probably just walk down the street and have it. Just again, be careful if you don't know where the what's been sprayed around there. I don't know if they spray chemicals or pesticides or gosh knows what out there. Um, just make sure that whatever you have, you know where it came from and it's okay to pluck it <laughs> and also that you wash it so you get any pesticides or weird stuff off of it. Um, and it does have a little bit of a, a bitter flavor. Uh, the other thing with the hibiscus is it is an acid um, to the mouth and so after drinking it, you might consider rinsing the mouth with water, especially if you're using the lemon um, in your original uh, tea preparation because again, acid enamel. You know, you want to you want to maintain your teeth. They're kind of important too. All right. Well, that's about all I got for you guys for your blood pressure. Just remember your numbers. You really want to be less than this for best health and longevity. Even less than 110, you're not going to go wrong with with that. Um, obviously, on the lower side, if your blood pressure is like less than 90 or less than 80 on the top number and less than 50 or 60, yes, you can go too low. Um, so if you're feeling lightheaded and dizzy etc., um, then please go check with your doctor as well. Um, a lot of times people find that they're able to influence these numbers a lot based on their diet, exercise, foods that they're having, amount of salt that they're having or not having. And so if you're taking any of these things to heart and you're on medications, please keep a close eye on the blood pressures because if you jump down too quick, your body can feel that and cause dizziness and lightheadedness and lack of blood flow to the brain and the kidneys and the heart is not a good thing. So. You want to just kind of go slow and keep a close eye on it and do talk to your physician about modifying the medications if needed. Um, and because some blood pressure medications like hydrochlorothiazide usually we can chop it in half, no problem, no side effects. 
But there's other high blood pressure medications like the beta blockers specifically that if you change them too quick, you can kind of get weird rhythm problems going on with the heart. And again, you don't want weird problems going on with the heart. So that's why it's always important, as always, um, use this information as educational only. Um, in a few minutes, I'll work on getting those references up in case you want to read where I was getting a lot of my stuff from tonight. But use that as a, um, a leapfrog to dialogue with your primary care physician about something that might be right for you. Alrighty, well, thank you guys for joining and uh, interacting. So it's always fun to have a conversation along with it too. I might not have all the answers, but I'll, I'll give you my best shot. <laughs> all right, good night guys, bye-bye.